in this lessons episode, discover how to integrate sustainability into your business model effectively, overcome resistance to change, and build brands that command premium pricing. Learn strategies to influence consumer behavior, balance costs, and drive innovation while staying ahead of market trends. So you, you, you see this and you see that there's an opportunity there and you're right. It's not, it's, it's a problem as opposed to just an opportunity. It's something that most businesses should be focused on, but ultimately not, not all are, not all are as focused on it as, as, as what you're doing, like the business model, the, the, the thesis of the business focuses on sustainability. So there is the opportunity there. So say, say you're a business leader and what you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to effectively tap into this movement, but also make it part of your core business. So it's not just a nice to have, but it's actually integral in how you build out your processes and you build out your product and you communicate with your customers. So for example, for better for all, you focus on sustainability as a, as a, as a key component of your business. How do you do that effectively? Well, I mean, you, first of all, you, with sustainability, you don't have to look very far. You've got, you've got the tip of the spear being the Gen Z population. That is 88% of them, according to McKenzie, <laughs> uh, just think companies are blowing smoke in terms of they're trying to ease their way into sustainability or trying to use solutions that already exist that really are not sustainable. You've got 40% of that growth, same population with making decisions on what companies they purchase and what companies they support based on that company's commitment to the climate, commitment to the planet, and commitment to sustainability. That, to me, is a business opportunity. And, and when you look at what companies are pushing, they're pushing um, old solutions. There is no recycling. You know, let, let's be let's be candid. There's five percent or less of recycled product goes into recycling, and then the recycling process, in terms of sorting, is so labor intensive that even a smaller portion of that gets recycled. People are tired of single use. They really want reusable, but not reusable forever. They're looking for reusable till they want to get rid of it. But when they want to get rid of it, they want it to disappear in a reasonable amount of time. And then they look, what's this product made of? Am I depleting the planet's natural resources? So, you know, from my standpoint, in terms of whether you're talking to an entrepreneur, why fight it? Consumer who has actually influenced the generation above them, the generation below them, and actually is leading it, is making a demand that is not going to go away. Do you think so we should get out of the way and, and make it happen? Do you think people fight it because they're concerned about it's complicated, it's expensive, like all the regular pushback, like the, the, this is already difficult for me to figure out. I'm just trying to build a basic business. I don't have to add layers of complexity onto it just to play a devil's advocate. What are the reasons why somebody wouldn't do this? Why availability? Um, I, I know we, we took a look when we first started the business in packaging. Yeah. You know, yeah, packaging is, um, is, a, is, is sitting right there, but now you're the product. Now you're the item that you tear away to get at the product you bought. And, and now what do you do with it? Now, the ideal thing is to have, have the, the um, product um, disappear in a reasonable amount of time. But what, what we chose to do with Better For All, and we make a cup. So we make a variety of cups because, one, it's universal. They're used all over the world. Number two, they're, nine, they're used normally in a celebratory way, either with a cup of coffee or a cold drink or an or a adult beverage. And that, that and it's big. So there's a big opportunity. I was thinking, I was looking last week or, or, or recently at just the red cup, you know, you, they're, they're yeah. producing 7.4 billion a year what? units a year. I and mean, I think to myself, if, if you can just take a percentage of that business, you're going to have an impact on the planet. 
not not take them away from it, just have an impact. So why would a company go against it? I've I've run into this myself. This this will be a, a rebark story. So we had enormous success bringing out a line of shoes designed for aerobics, and we expanded around that those items with soft garment leather white product, and and they they were very very successful. Your success becomes your anchor because you're so busy. <laughs> Filling the demand, you're not innovating behind that demand. And more importantly, you're not coming with the car of the future. And so consequently, we peaked, we started to go down, and then we needed to come out with something that fit consumer demand. So we came out with the pump. And the consumer was saying, loud and clear, no differently than sustainability, I want a product that gives me more support. I want a product that gives me protection. I want a product that gives me custom fit. I go back to my days with the Porsche guy, and I take a look at the pump shoe, and I said, does that shoe give you support, protection, and custom fit? And is it unique enough looking that it doesn't look like everything on the market? And that thing saved Reebok's butt. So I, I look at companies, why are they resisting it? Candidly, it might be because they don't have time to look at something or it's not readily available um, in, in what they're doing, or even worse than that, that we're going to require them retooling. And, and um, yeah, you know, I, I would say it's more expensive not to change than it is to change. You know, and that's not a euphem euphemism. Uh, I, I've, I've been in the seat where you held on and turned the lights out on the industry. Um, and that, that is not a fun thing to do. That's expensive. You know, one thing that you've done very well across, again, all the companies is, and you mentioned this briefly at the beginning, you've, it's never been a race to the bottom. You focus on building a product that can command a price point in the market that allows you to create the best possible product. And that gives you margin to allow you to conduct business in a different way. So if, for example, a sustainability focused company say the product isn't as cheap i'm assuming that the the cogs on that product is slightly more than a non-sustainable product but you've built brands that support that business model effectively so that you can charge for a product that's a little bit more expensive to make or produce even and i don't even know i could be incorrect it could be totally the same and happy to have that conversation but the point i'm making is as a, as somebody who's done this repeatedly how do you build that brand that, that allows for that price point in the market, that allows for buyers to be okay spending a premium, uh, a premium amount of money on whatever you're selling? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to answer out of both sides of my mouth, all right? I, Go for it. I think to answer your, I, th I think to answer your, uh, um, your question in a short answer is who influences the buyer? You know, who, how, do you, how do you influence the influencer? so that you get your, your um, trendsetter putting the product, taking the product, you get the early adopter taking the product, you get the general population to get in the product, and the pyramid builds. And so you're always looking for, do I influence through my yoga instructor? Do I influence through my coach? Do I influence through my school? Do I influence, influence through my team? But how do I influence somebody? Um, the other one is coming out of the other side of my mouth. You can't price this product based on cost because the, you look at the tech industry, they've taught us anything with Amazon and you take a look at Tesla. You've got to price it to where you get you get you can get the volume, you can get the efficiency, you can get the raw material cost down and you get the accesses to cross at some time in reasonable future. But you're pricing the product at a slight premium, not an obscene premium. And, 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 and you keep your operating expenses at variable expense rather than fixed. So you, you gotta, you got to look at what business am I in? We've chosen to be in the design, development, and marketing business. Now what we look for, do we have experts in source in material? Do we have experts in manufacturing? Do we have experts in 
uh, social media and marketing and, and advertising and promotion that we can access so that our expenses are variable and we don't make them fixed until we actually have the top line revenue and margins to be able to support the company. So I'm not, tr I would advise people don't bury a company in fixed expenses that are not your core business. Thanks for tuning in. If you found this valuable, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you want to dive deeper into this conversation, check out the links in the description to watch the full episode. See you in the next one.